and particularly in reference to that phrase, another Jesus. According to the scriptures, Satan has a plan to deceive. He deceives us even in a gospel that appears to be the gospel, but it's a counterfeit. And also, rather than the true Jesus and the true gospel, there is another Jesus. Why? Because there's another spirit. And Satan... 4, verses 4 to 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many, not a few, shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In the 24th verse. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In the 23rd verse of Matthew 24, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. And verse 26 of Matthew 24, if therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. All of these verses that I've read from Matthew 24 seem to deal with this time of deception. Many deceived by many in his name. False appearances of Christ associated with lying signs and wonders. And again, we should listen carefully. As Peter said, prophecy like a light shining in a dark place. We should beware of what's going to happen. And this afternoon I want to talk to you about this particular area. Perhaps it would have been better to label this message a sign of the times, because that's what I'm going to deal with, this one particular aspect, and that is false appearances of Jesus Christ. And it will continue where we left off last night, dealing with another aspect of deception, which is occurring in the name of Christianity, dealing with the Queen who prepares the way for a counterfeit king. The queen, in reference to, as we talked about, Our Lady. Often called Our Lady of Fatima, or as she supposedly has appeared in various other places. Called the Queen of Heaven. And as referenced in Jeremiah chapter 7 and chapter 44, the Queen of Heaven was an abomination unto God. As Pastor John mentioned last night in, in the conclusion, if you're interested, in the latter part of this book there's a chapter called The Queen of All, The New Wine and the Babylonian Vine, in which we go into the historical aspect of the Queen of Heaven, where she came from, biblically, and the role that she has played through history, and particularly today, of various religions, whether Hinduism or other religions, even Islam, that are focusing in on the so-called Queen of Heaven, who many call Mary, and how this is bringing people together, religiously. Now, I want to point to you that not only is she the Queen of Heaven or the Queen of Peace to many people, but she's also been labeled as the mother of the Eucharistic Jesus. And that's going to be the focus of this talk here this afternoon. The Queen of Heaven, here you see represented as Our Lady of Paris. And you will notice in this image that has been reconstructed from a supposed apparition, that you see Mary and baby Jesus, and Mary is standing on a moon, and between the moon and her feet is a serpent. Why would that be? 
Well, it fits, you see, into what I was sharing with you last night. This idea that Mary shares in redemption that she is co-redeemer. And many of these so-called apparitions have appeared in this form. Here's Our Lady of All Nations, supposedly appeared in Amsterdam. And there it makes it very clear. This image makes a point. There you see Mary on a cross. And the agenda that we're moving towards, and that's what this book deals with, is Mary taking this position, the Sharian redemption. Or, if that doesn't happen, there will never be peace. Last night I read to you a few of the messages, and let me repeat just a few. Dear children, I am especially grateful that you are here tonight, adore unceasingly the most blessed sacrament of the altar. Know that I am always present when the faithful are adoring. Or another supposed message from an apparition of Mary. Dear children, today I invite you to fall in love with the most holy sacrament on the altar. Adore him, little children, in your parishes. And this way you will be united with the entire world. And then this statement, another so-called message from heaven. Today I ask all to throw open the doors to Jesus Christ who is coming. I am the mother of the second advent. And the door which is being opened on the new era, this new era will coincide with the greatest triumph of the Eucharistic reign of Jesus. The Eucharistic Jesus will release all his power of love which will transform souls, the church, and all humanity. Now, maybe you're not following what I'm saying. I'm using these terms, Eucharist, Eucharistic Jesus, Eucharistic reign of Jesus. What is this all about? Well, now I'm going to explain to you who the Eucharistic Jesus is. And in order to do so, we need to look at some definitions. And the source of these definitions, well, I'm not just making up the definitions. They come from sources that I've obtained, Catholic sources. And we must understand some basic terms. Number one is transubstantiation. What does that mean? According to Joan Carroll Cruz in the book Eucharistic Miracles, the word officially approved by the Council of Trent to express the changing of the entire substance of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. After the consecration, only the appearances or accidents, color, taste, smell, quantity, etc. of bread and wine remain. Well, that gives us part of the picture, but let's continue. What do we mean when we talk about Eucharist? Well, again, another definition from the same book, Eucharistic Miracles. It's the sacrament in which under the appearances of bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ are truly, really, and substantially present as the grace-producing food of our souls. More specifically, the consecrated host and the consecrated wine, that is, the precious blood. And this will help to illuminate this further, now reading from the Catechism of the Catholic Church regarding the sacrament of the Eucharist, 1324. The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian faith, the other sacraments, and indeed all the ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it, for the blessed Eucharist is contained in the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself, our Pasch. 